My name is uh, Tasman Crow, uh, and I'm the director of the UCD Earth Institute, which is, which is UCD's Institute for Environmental and Sustainability Research. Um, you're very, very welcome to, to UCD in conversation. Uh, this series reflects UCD's rising to the future strategy and, it, and its four pillars, which are creating a sustainable global society, transforming through digital technology, building a healthy world, and empowering humanity. Today's episode is entitled, Why is Ending Hunger So Difficult? And after a steadily declining for a decade, world hunger is now on the rise again. So why do people still go hungry when we have enough food, supposedly? Why is so much food wasted? What are the challenges of enabling productivity and profitability through sustainable systems of food production? This episode is in collaboration with UCD Alumni Relations and the UCD Earth Institute and picks up from the UCD SDG seminar series, which the Earth Institute hosted uh, in 2019 to 2020, and brought together academics, alumni, and, and stakeholders to explore the research needs for addressing each of the goals. And you can find a link for the records of these in the chat. Today's webinar should be an, an hour long and will include a Q&A towards the end. So please do submit your questions through the, throughout the conversation using the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. The event is also taking place within the framework of UCD's membership of United Nations Academic Impact. And UNAI aligns institutions of higher education with the United Nations in supporting and contributing to the realization of the UN goals and mandates, including the promotion and protection of human rights, access to education, sustainability, and conflict resolution. Today's conversation will be led by Professor Dolores O'Riordan. And Dolores is the UCD Vice Principal for Global Engagement and the Director of the UCD Institute of Food and Health. After completing a PhD in protein chemistry and six years of international industrial research and development in the area of food ingredients, she joined the food science team at UCD in 1995. Her expertise in the areas of physical and chemical analysis of foods and food formulation technology underpins her extremely successful research career, which has been characterized by extensive collaboration with the food industry and by engagement with advisory bodies and the international research community. The current research focuses on enhancing, enhancing the functionality and health benefits of food ingredients with a focus on food structure and digestibility. So now I'll hand it over to, to Dolores who will lead the conversation and introduce us to our expert panelists. So thanks very much indeed Dolores and it's over to you. Thanks so much Taz for that introduction. I'm delighted to be part of these discussions today. So a warm welcome to you all. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on what part of the world you're joining us from. So this is the really important topic of world hunger. And by hunger, we're not meaning the rumblings in our tummies if some of us are having a late lunch today, but it defines periods when populations are experiencing severe food insecurity. So populations, going hungry for entire days. And unfortunately, hunger does lead to death. And although we do produce enough food to feed the global population, as many as 811 million people still go hungry. And as Taz said, unfortunately, hunger is on the rise. So to join uh, me today in discussing this important topic, I'd like to introduce my two colleagues from the School of Agriculture and Food Science at UCD. The first is Professor Jim Kinsler, and Jim has extensive experience working in Ethiopia, Somalia, Tanzania, and Kenya. He currently is Professor of Agricultural Extension and Rural Development at UCD, and his research involves rural livelihoods analysis, rural development policy impact, agricultural innovation, and social farming. Now, knowledge transfer is a big part of Jim's work, and today, I'm looking forward to him sharing his knowledge on this topic with us, and I'm sure he'll draw on his real life experiences and his research in the area. I'd also like to welcome Dr. Africa Sullivan. So Africa is an assistant professor and associate dean for international programs, also in the School of Agriculture and Food Science. Africa's research is in human nutrition, and she has a particular interest in sustainable, healthy diets and also has a significant body of research in childhood nutrition. And very relevant to today's discussion is her work on agriculture and nutrition links 
and particularly on a project that she conducted in Tanzania. So now, as Taz said, we're going to chat to our, our panelists, but remember, we are taking your questions. So again, as to remind you to place them in the Q&A tab, and when we've had a discussion with the panelists, we'll try and answer as many as we can. So to begin, as we strive towards our sustainability development goal of zero hunger, perhaps we'll start by trying to understand what the causes of hunger are from our two panelists' perspective. So I might just begin with, with you, Jim, to give your perspective. Thanks, Dolores. Um, and it's, it's great to have the opportunity to, to be part of the discussion on, on this particular um, goal. Uh, that we have facing us um, within the SDGs. Um, before coming to your actual question, Dolores, I, I just like to kind of remind us all that, you know, there have been substantial improvements over the past 25 years in addressing um, the uh, hunger agenda, in, in reaching people who are in severe um, food insecurity. So we need to recognize that we do have a fairly recent history of, of improvements being made and on target towards the SDGs uh, or the Millennium Development Goals in that period up to 2015. And many households in poor countries, you know, were positively affected by the economic success in their, in their own countries. Um, it allowed incomes to rise, especially in East and Southeast Asia and Latin America. So there is a context here. And in some ways we're saying, look, you know, we have made gains on addressing this issue. However, as, as rightly highlighted by yourself and, and Taz at the outset, um, you know, there's, uh, th there is a clearly a recognition that the fight against hunger is dangerously off track. We're going in the wrong directions, particularly since uh, 2015 and particularly over the last two years. Um, I think our success in the past, we need to liken it to the idea of um, picking low hanging fruits. This comes to mind with me that in fact we have been uh, in many ways engaging with those around the hunger agenda who are perhaps easier to engage with and this is something to think about into the future that uh, those who are currently experiencing hunger are, are really difficult to connect with and engage, and we haven't been very successful in the past. There's also a wider context uh, to this particular hunger debate, and that is that uh, not only the 800 plus uh, million who are estimated to, to um, be undernourished, severely undernourished, but there's also, um, you know, about 30% of the global population experiencing food insecurity, maybe at a more moderate level than the severe level. So, so this, is, this is not just an issue which is focused on, on the 811 million estimates, but, but also a much wider group um, who face food insecurity at times during the year, uh, maybe on a seasonal basis, um, et cetera. So where we're primarily focused on taking a bird's eye view, looking at the globe, is we're looking at uh, where the highest prevalence of hunger exists for this discussion. And this is, we're talking about South Asia and particular Sub-Saharan Africa. And Sub-Saharan Africa is where about 60% of the population um, currently are, are uh, said to be food insecure, both at a moderate and severe level. And about 26% of the population are uh, experiencing severe food insecurity. And within that regional dimension, we, we need to think about, well, who are these people? Because we, rather than have a tendency to simplify it, um, we need to recognize that this is a very diverse group. Many of them are economically active. They're either uh, smallholder farmers, uh, they could be agricultural laborers, they could be landless um, people, they could be pastoralists. Um, and there's not only rural, but there's also the urban dimension. Casual laborers in, in urban centers also fall into this category of experiencing severe food insecurity or, or hunger. So, you know, they're, they're quite a diverse group. And within that, we also have differences in particular that women, are, are, women and girls are, are more affected by uh, chronic severe hunger. Um, so, so we need to be 
nuanced in the way we, we talk about, you know, who is hunger affecting. So to get to, in many ways, Dolores, your, your, your question, I think the fundamental poverty and inequality that exists is really at, at the core of, of, of the um, hunger statistics, that there is for a long time chronic poverty associated with the inequalities which exist, which aren't being addressed, which aren't being reached. So uh, in some ways we shouldn't be surprised when we look over our shoulders as to, you know, why, why are we not succeeding? Um, we also have the added contributions to uh, severe um, food um, insecurity in terms of conflict in regions, so civil unrest, climate extremes, natural resource, natural, re natural re disasters, and indeed economic shock, shocks, uh, very often tied to energy prices. So for example, keeping in mind that the food price index is, is up 28% between 2020 uh, 20 and 2021. And that, that has a, a real shock to the system, an economic shock to the system for, for, for um, poor people. And you overlay that with COVID, the COVID pandemic, which is its, itself a contributing factor. So with all that said, my, my own background is coming from the agriculture sector, the rural sector. And clearly here we see that, you know, we've, we've left down uh, the investment in, in agriculture. We have a, an underinvestment in agriculture and rural development and in food systems for quite a long period of time, particularly picking up the story from the mid 80s. We have a long history of underinvestment in agriculture. So when we came to maybe reinvesting in agriculture from about 2005 onwards, we found that you know, there was a long period of, 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 of neglect, underinvestment, uh, weak systems developed. So we're playing catch up here. So, so when we come to the agriculture sector specifically, um, there is a, a history of underinvestment. And, and even currently one can argue we are way underinvested in key aspects of agriculture, which I, I, I can happily touch on later on. So maybe I think in terms of trying to address the big question of why um, I, I might have said enough at the moment. Thanks so much, Jim, and thanks for the positive start as well, the fact that we had been making progress, so I'm sure we can get onto it later, that there are obviously some strategies that we were working for us and we can return to them. So perhaps moving to you, uh, Afrik, and I suppose you're coming at it more from a nutrition perspective, and I think Jim is made a very important point as well about making sure that we're acknowledging the food insecurity rather than the severe hunger as well. And I think that's an area you've been looking at yourself in your research. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad Jim, Jim touched on those kind of broad, uh, big causes of hunger. And I'm going to zone in completely from my perspective and come at it as a, as a nutritionist. And as a nutritionist, I think of the kind of individual or maybe the household level um, and look at the challenges kind of from that perspective or that setting. And I think one of the, the research projects actually that Jim was also involved in kind of highlights some of those kind of household level um, differences that seem to impact kind of who is going hungry, who's food insecure, and then the kind of knock on effects of that in terms of malnutrition. And this was a project that we were both involved in in Tanzania where we were looking at kind of farming practices um, at household level and then how they relate to how kind of well-nourished or malnourished um, mothers and children were within those households. Um, and so within that project, we were able to identify four different types of farming systems and, and that's Jim's work. Um, and so, so for example, you had, you had farmers or households who, who were just growing a single crop you had households that were, were growing mixed crops and you had households that were growing mixed crops and also had livestock. And we were interested then to compare kind of the nutrition status of the, the families and the children in particular. And what we could see was that there was two of, two of the four different types of farm, farmers that were particularly sensitive. Uh, and this brings up another uh, issue and Jim also touched on it in, in terms of time of year. So we, we did measurements in the pre-harvest season and in the post-harvest season. So in the post-harvest season, you have more food available. 
uh, in the pre-harvest season, you've less food available and you've got a, a higher workload as well, which has added uh, problems in terms of food security and hunger and malnutrition. Um, so two, two of those four were particularly sensitive to that kind of pre to post season changes. And so what we were able to show, you know, we're talking about food insecurity and there, there's a very kind of a standardized way to measure food insecurity and it really relates to access to food. And uh, we were able to see between that kind of pre-harvest or post-harvest, so the hungry and the kind of more surplus time of year, you see quite a significant change in those two particular kind of farming type households. So jumping from 80% of the households in those, those two farming kind of um, types being food insecure in the pre-harvest season, uh, and that would drop then quite significantly in the, in the post-harvest season. So you were going from about 80% insecure to about 30 to 40% insecure in, in the post-harvest season. And again, this was reflected then in, in what we, we kind of measure in terms of the nutrition status of the children in that the measurements we take, so one typical measurement we take to, to measure or monitor malnutrition is mid upper arm circumference for children under five. And you see quite a significant change. So I suppose what that was telling us is that food access and food supply and the different types of food. So diet diver diversity is another kind of important measurement when it comes to talking about hunger and malnutrition, that access and diet diversity are really important um, at that individual and household level. And I suppose then linking in with the farming types, farming type or background has an impact on kind of what food is available and the types of foods then that are there for the household members to consume. But there was kind of another layer onto that as well. It wasn't just what foods were available and when they were available. The different farming uh, backgrounds or types, there was different numbers within the household. So the, these two groups that were particularly sensitive had more, more people in the household. They had lower income and they had less education. So it wasn't just, although food access and diet diversity was really important, you have to kind of consider the, the additional elements of income, education, and then I suppose how many mouths there are to feed within the household. So I think it's just a nice illustration of that kind of individual household level and the, the complexity that is there. Um, it's, it's not just the access to food, but there, there's a lot else to be considered when you're talking about and a hunger and malnutrition at that level. Yeah, I mean, of course, it's it's going to be multifactorial, but I suppose picking up on a point that you, you've both made, I suppose the, the access to food, the availability of, of food, and it might seem very obvious, but it has to come from the core of agriculture. So maybe to go back to you, Jim, in terms of strategies, you mentioned that we haven't had the investment in, in agriculture, perhaps that we should have, and yet, we see an awful lot of technological developments on the agricultural front, certainly here in Ireland um, and in more developed countries. So there must be an opportunity on that front. Is that one of the strategies or perhaps you can identify others? Yeah, I think, Dolores, on, on, on our ability to um, identify and to promote and to support um, improved practices and technology adoption in agriculture, um, you know, we're, we're, we're very strong at that. I'm specifically talking about the investment towards specifically the hunger agenda and reaching the poorest. So we're talking mainly about what's happened in investment in agriculture as it relates to development assistance over time. But, but, but your point about can we develop the technology? Absolutely, we're doing it. But we're not doing it for the smallholder farmers. We're not doing it for the landless labourers, and we're not doing it for many women farmers in in uh, economically poor countries. So, to me, uh, my response to your question about you know how might we go about addressing and improving the situation um, is that we do need a, a, a new approach. Um, if we keep doing the same things we're doing, we will get the same results. And and you know many of the uh, fora and the summits around this issue at the moment are saying we're going in the wrong direction here 
Um, and, you know, so, so, so that's the signal to us that there is a need for uh, a, a reconsidered pathway. So it's, it's, it's about our approach, our mindset, our commitment. And start, the starting off point is recognizing the complexity and diversity that exists. And I think Africa was in focusing on the households uh, work that we were both involved in in Tanzania, highlighted very well that even within a village, within a community, um, within a farming community, within a village, you will have diversity. Um, you will have different farming systems uh, existing side by side. So the sheer complexity of engaging with poor people and the diversity associated with the, the poor and, and chronically hungry people. Um, I, I, I'm saying we don't fully appreciate in our approach to it. So, so you know, we, we have a tendency to think it's, uh, it's, it's all the same. One, one, um, one approach uh, will, will deliver, but, but that is not the case. So we need to have nuanced interventions, in my opinion, to reach these poor households, especially in agriculture. Um, and that can be done through, you know, uh, improving the way in which we deliver services, first of all, the way in which we deliver uh, services like um, extension and advisory services that has played such a fundamental role in uh, developing farming systems throughout the world. So engaging with these smallholders, because many of them are not engaged, they haven't been engaged. Um, for, for some of the reasons I talked about earlier, about the lack of investment in agriculture, but also about the mindset of the institutions and the individuals involved. Um, I think also um, we, we need to consider, you know, training and education, technology development and research for smallholder farmers. I, I, and again, Dolores, your, your point about can we develop sophisticated technology for client needs? Of course we can. We're doing it. We have done it. We also talk about credit, the importance of, of access to credit for people. So, you know, it's it's not one 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 thing, it's, it's a whole series of things that we need to rethink, recalibrate, and ensure that as we're delivering, we're delivering it with the complexity and diversity in mind and reaching these, these poor households. We also need to enable, I think, um, greater stocks of social capital or greater organization amongst um, these groups because they're very often invisible and voiceless in the system. So farmer organizations, community organizations that will have add voice and advocate um, for this group is important and also give them the confidence to make changes themselves, whether it's in their farming system or in, in uh, taking on economic opportunities. We also, you know, part of the solution is the farming practices that, that are, will be, will and should be promoted. These need to be low risk and they also need to be climate smart. Um, so the whole suite of interventions around climate smart agriculture, again, need to be nuanced to be low risk, adoptable for uh, these, these households. Um, a solution also is not just embedded in farming uh, people's way out of the problem, but also in diversification of livelihoods, other opportunities, whether they're on farm, creating new, new commodities, or whether they're off farm, which has been a hugely important um, platform for, for many farming households to improve their uh, um, uh, improve their household income. Currently, um, I have a PhD student working in Ethiopia, and she's looking at the, the effects um, of diversification uh, as it relates to farmers being able to mitigate against climate change. And it's very clear um, that the um, extent to which households have diversified their income streams gives them a very different platform to work from. And they're no longer as vulnerable, they're no longer as, as chronically poor or hungry as they were. There are those who, who just can't engage the marketplace, whether it's for commodities or labor. So there is, there is also a need for social protection and safety nets. The, the bottom line is older people, perhaps orphans within community or vulnerable children, um, uh, people with disabilities, all of these need uh, social protection. They need safety nets in place. And, and they are part of, of this group also. Um, I think there is a need fundamentally for a, a, not just a commitment, but also a sustained and increased investment. 
The bottom line is we need to seriously invest in addressing this issue. And if we continue doing it the way we're doing it, well, then we needn't be surprised if we meet in 10 years time for those of us who are still on Zoom calls, um, that that will be that that will be the result. Um, so I, th I think I might leave leave my response at that, uh, Dolores. Thanks very, very much, Jim. And I, I suppose, Patrick, Jim was bringing up the gender equality there. And I suppose a lot of your work really was done with mothers in the field, wasn't it? So are there yeah. strategies there that you see could improve? Yeah, and I guess I guess one of the reasons that we were focused on, on women and, and young children, um, or why I suppose a lot of my research is focused on, on kind of young children, is that you've got that cycle of, of if children are hungry and if they're not getting the critical nutrients that they need at critical times, that that's again having another knock-on effect. So very simply, if you think that a child is going to school hungry, then they're not going to get the same out of school as a child who is well nourished is going to get. And that has knock on implications for their own kind of development and future. And so, again, that feeds back into that cycle of poverty and hunger and and all of that. So it's a really critical kind of a, a population group, I suppose. And um, one of the reasons then that, that, that we, we focus on it. On, on children. But um, in terms of strategies, again, I suppose I would come at this same question from, from my own perspective. Um, and, and again, thinking at a household level, and actually it, it does into that kind of vulnerable group of, of children. It's, it's if, we're, if we're talking about access to food, which is one of the things that we've kind of both touched on um, over these two questions, um, it, like ensuring access to food within a household is important at the household level, but also at the, the level of the individual household member. So we not only need to make sure that there's access to food year round, but also that the most vulnerable are getting the most nutritious food within that household as well. And I suppose while we've, we've touched on hunger and I, I meant to mention it in the previous, um, um, in relation to the previous question, we need to think about kind of hunger kind of in more depth. It's not just, it's not just energy intake, um, it's critical nutrient intake as well. And I suppose that's where we see um, kind of huge deficits uh, as well. It's, it's not just uh, pure energy. There's critical micronutrients and protein that um, we, we see huge implications from in terms of childhood nutrition in particular. So um, any strategies? I might just there, just looking at one of the questions coming in is actually on that area. So I might, might just take that now. So it's about uh, the current estimates of micronutrient deficiency measured as part of food insecurity. The food insecurity measurement that I mentioned um, in, in kind of what I was talking about in response to the previous question, no, it doesn't. It, it's asking questions like, how often have you gone to bed hungry? How often have you not been able to consume the types of foods that you would like to consume? And those kind of broader questions. So from a micronutrient perspective, what we would need to do, I mean, the, the big ones, the big micronutrients that are problematic kind of around the world are iron, iodine and vitamin A. And for those, we would need either a blood or urine sample to measure them. So there's quite a lot you can do in the field. And, and one of the measurements we included in that Tanzanian project was a finger prick blood sample, which is a good indication of iron status. And that's what would be used most routinely, um, particularly in the field in poorer countries. Um, Iodine is actually a relative success story in terms of we're looking at the positives um, and improvements that have happened globally over the last number of years. There is a very successful uh, intervention with iodized salt. So a lot of the um, poorer countries in the world use iodized salt, which means that their iodine intakes now are at levels that are actually better than our own here in Ireland. If you look at iodine at the moment, we um, actually have relatively high rates of, of um, kind of poor iodine intake even in Ireland. So there are some success stories um, and even uh, as Jim ha has touched on there, but I suppose going forward in terms of strategies, we need to 
um, think about those types of interventions from an agriculture or a nutrition perspective that are sustainable over time as well. And I think Jim touched on education and outreach um, and knowledge transfer being really important in that respect. And I think that applies then to um, kind of nutrition or the nutrition side of things as well. So it's, it's not only important to be growing the types of foods that um, the children within the household or, or whoever needs within the household, but it's knowing then who needs them in what amounts, how to cook them, how to prepare them and that kind of thing. That's also important. And again, that will be important for ensuring kind of the essential micronutrients and other nutrients are supplied. Thanks, Afric. So I suppose you, you, you're both clearly identifying what, what strategies would work. Um, well, obviously, we would have a work to make them work because there's obviously something not quite right at the moment, looking at the figures that we have. And so maybe staying with you for, for the moment, Afric, I can see from what you're saying that we need action from a lot of fronts. It's, it's from a political point of view, government point of view, Jim referred to behavioural change, which will involve the whole of society and then back down to your, your personal level, speaking to the diversification, both from people experiencing the hunger and the causes of hunger. So if you had to identify from your perspective, Africa, a key action that you think would make that step change. So hopefully, Jim, we won't be back here in 10 years time around a Zoom but that we will see a change, I suppose, in, in the hunger uh, stats that we're seeing at the moment and to have a positive impact. Okay. What I, I suppose, I suppose the, 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 the end of the answer is, is a sustainable, something that's sustainable and that, that delivers independence um, and resilience for, for households and communities. But from a very practical level, um, there's two, two kind of um, interventions that, that come to mind. Um, one is very specific and acute, and it's not really touching on the um, more sustainable side of, of a, a nutrition intervention in the field, but it just was very effective. It was a project that kind of spun out of the Tanzanian project. It was in Uganda, and it was in connection with the uh, UCD volunteers overseas. And so it was a relatively small group of, of uh, children who were attending a physiotherapy clinic in um, Uganda and they were on site in a hospital for, for two weeks. So as a team, we had access to their, the kind of food they were getting and also we had access to their treatment for that two week period. And these, these were children who were quite unwell. Um, and over the two week period, we introduced, obviously they were getting all of their meals, but we introduced milk and eggs on a daily basis for that two weeks for the children. And in, in only two weeks, we were able to see significant, clinically significant changes in their nutrition status uh, with that introduction of, of milk and eggs and, and both being sources of not just essential amino acids, but also essential micronutrients. So. That's a very specific acute example, um, but it just kind of, I think, shows what can be done in a short amount of time. But as I said, it doesn't really touch on that more sustainable side of things. So a follow on project to that, that one was again tying in with the UCD volunteers overseas group. And this time we built um, and helped to fund a community-based project in the communities surrounding the hospital area in Uganda. And um, with that project, we identified families and households who were re being repeatedly admitted to hospital with, with malnourished children. And we set up a demo garden in the hospital. So whilst staying in the hospital, when these families were in the hospital, they were taught about gardening, they were taught about growing um, different types of, of fruits and vegetables. They were then supported when they left the hospital with resources and with the community outreach workers. So they were given a hen and um, some seeds to start a vegetable garden at home in the community. And then I think importantly, that community support worker from an education and a support and a monitoring perspective. And so interventions kind of not saying that that's the best type of intervention but it's it's kind of 
building in those elements of um, kind of support and education that make it, I suppose, more sustainable over time and build that kind of resilience and independence uh, over time. I think that that's critical when, when you're thinking about really getting out of that hunger malnutrition hole. Yeah, so and very impactful results with, and I'm very familiar with the UCD VO program, you know, not a significant amount of financial investment in order to, to get those results. And, and maybe before we move to the Q, Q, Q and I'm sorry, I should say within the q and I did see someone was uh, already bringing up the idea of kitchen gardens um, and having a, a positive experience with them, uh, particularly where, where land is limited. So maybe, Jim, o over to you, if you to pick a key action. Well, it would go totally against everything I've said, um, <laughs> Dolores. The reason being that just highlighting the complexity and the diversity. So to me, a key, uh, the, the, uh, I suppose, a, a key point I'd like to say about, you know, how might we address it, what actions we could take, is they, they need to be better informed and more nuanced. Um, and there needs to be increased investment and there needs to be increased commitment. Um, you know, unless we're prepared to do that, well, then, unfortunately, we will have the scenario that we won't make the, the gains or have the traction that we would like. If you could just bear with me, I, I kind of structured my thought on this particular issue, you know, from a political point of view, what might we think about? Um, and I think that public policies need to be um, configured so that they are trying to reach and include chronically poor households. The reality is many of them don't right across the spectrum, um, everything from the education and health right across to the economic, uh, including agriculture. And in tandem with that, so we need the, good, we need the policies to be uh, adapted to address uh, needs of the poor. We also need institutional arrangements that will support that. We need capacity building of institutions. We need reorientation, reconfiguring of how they go about their work with whom and the methods that they use. I think at a societal level, we won't talk about them, the political at the moment, we'll talk about the societal. At the societal level, I think we need to be much more connected and informed um, about what's going on. I think we, we many of us uh, struggle to be adequately informed and certainly relying on media coverage, which tends to be, you know, follow media fatigue and the big stories. We don't get the full story, so we don't we don't really appreciate um, the issues. And going back to Africa's depiction of the household and the poor household, you know, trying to get our heads around just what's going on. How do people survive? What do you do in the event that you are hungry? What does it mean? What does it look like? I mean, we really do have to have a better grasp of all of this. So we need to be better informed. We also need to advocate for change. And to be prepared to accept the consequences of shifting resources to address global food insecurity. It will uh, be a cost to us if we're going to address this. And we need to recognize that and we need to be prepared to do it. Finally, at an individual level, I'll let shut up then. Um, <laughs> we, need, we, need, we, need, we need to add our voice when it comes to you know, electing our politicians, asking of our politicians. They are our representatives. They're good people, but they're our representatives. So we need to add our voice to what our concerns are. Uh, we need to, to watch our purchases. You know, we as consumers have an influence on the marketplace, which translates into impacting on poor households. And we need to be prepared to put our money where our mouth is and to invest and donate accordingly. So in many ways, I'm saying that a big part of the solution lies with us individually, um, rather than looking over our shoulder at other people. I'll stop at that. Thanks, Jim and Afric. Now you've stimulated a lot of questions here in, in the chat. I'll try and, there are a lot there. So thank you all so much for posting the questions uh, and we'll try and get through as many as possible. But in the interest of time, I, I might just try and group them. So the, there were a few questions around that delicate balance between the environmental impact of agriculture versus the challenge of feeding a, a growing population. Uh, and one specific question speaks to the small holding farmers, um, suggesting that the most environmental unsuitable models are there. So there seems to be a disconnect between striking the balance between the environment 
and feeding the world. I don't know who wants to make a start on that. I, I might just react to that because, um, yes, I understand where uh, this contribution is coming from, that there is clearly a tension between delivering our, our food requirements to a glo growing global population and the way in which um, we go about our business and, and, and the um, consequences on the environment and ultimately um, impact on climate. Um, I think, you know, the smallholders um, are, are very often caught in a system of farming, which um, is uh, unfortunately challenging the soils, the water use, the environment um, in order to survive. Um, so, so there is uh, certainly a, a pressure on smallholders to put massive pressure on their natural environment in order for them to survive. There are solutions, there are better ways of, of farming, there are climate smart ways, there are conservation principles, there are ways of improving soils at low risk, and we need to reach these households with those solutions. So it almost goes back to a point you made earlier, uh, Dolores, about the technologies. You know, we actually do have very good solutions and answers. They're, they're developed and available and promoted, unfortunately, at a wide scale, and there's still uh, many of them not reaching the, the poorest households in the most remote areas. So I, I, I think I understand where that contribution is coming from, but I, I, I think there is very strong evidence that good conservation farming, good climate smart agriculture can be part of, of the solution, which gets the balance right between uh, agriculture, the environment and the global food needs. Thanks, Jim. And I suppose, Related to that is, is a question with regards to the food systems approach. So we as a country have adapted national strategy to say we will take a food systems approach. So the, the question is around, has the concept of food systems featured in either your works in recent years? Are there any links made between domestic production and trade choices or policy and food security in low income countries? And there's a follow on question with regards to the Irish uh, Food Vision 2030 strategy. Um, do you think that Ireland has the right structure and approach to share knowledge that will support the agency of citizens in low income countries choose what food they produce and eat? So I suppose thoughts around that whole food systems approach and Ireland's role in the, the global food production arena. I might just jump in to give you a break, Jim. <laughs> and, and, and I suppose I'll answer this from, from, again, my perspective. And this has obviously crept into our research here uh, in UCD. And uh, again, this is a project funded by the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine. And um, it's something that we're looking at. So taking that food systems approach and looking at how our dietary intake um, impacts the environment. Um, so from a food systems approach, when we're looking at the impact of diet on, on environment, there's various measures that we can use and, and there's the life cycle assessment, assessment methods that, that take that kind of food systems approach to estimate the impact of food on environment. Um, and so what we're trying to do in, in a very recent project, which is actually going to be recruiting participants, if there's any of the uh, 100 people who are listening to this conversation want to volunteer, we'd be delighted to have you. But if, what we'll be doing is looking to see if we can reduce the impact that an Irish diet has on the environment. And so what will happen in that project is that we will have half of the group participants who will be eating the, the kind of standard healthy diet that we recommend in Ireland. And we'll have another half of the participants who will be eating what we are calling a more sustainable or more climate friendly diet. Um, and that will be, we will be making recommendations to reduce intakes of, of meat in particular really um, relative to, to what the current recommendations are and then looking to see what impact that that has on our nutrient intakes and, and also our, our nutrition status. And then ultimately what we will compare kind of the impact on the environmental measurements. And in this project, we're using greenhouse gas emissions as that estimate. 
So that that's for sure one way that that kind of food systems thinking is having an impact on our research in UCD and, and on kind of what recommendations then we will make um, kind of for changes in terms of kind of public health policy and the, the food based dietary guidelines in Ireland. So from my perspective, at least, I do think that that kind of food systems approach is filtering uh, th through the food system. Okay, and just before I go to you to get your views on that important topic, Jim, probably a question um, relating to the lack of a food systems uh, approach, which is that in developing countries, irrigation and agricultural policy are treated separately, as in separate government ministries. In your opinion, is that a barrier to addressing hunger? And I think that emphasises the approach that's in many countries where we don't have joined up thinking and we it's difficult to have that food systems approach, but I'll hand it over to you, Jim. Yeah, th thanks, Dolores. In some ways, the the um, the question almost answers itself here, in the um, idea that you know we we have in fact in the way in which we've approached uh, food production um, in a very narrow way, we focus just on uh, production and productivity, and and that in itself is only part of the wider food system. I, think, I do think that we are taking a more holistic view on food systems. I mean, the UN Food Systems Summit recently, you know, would, cap would have captured that in terms of not just looking at um, the producer and productivity gains and, and, and access to resources to enable that to happen, which was a lot of the points it was making earlier, but also uh, linking into the value chain system, that that becomes a very important part of the entire food system, what's happening in terms of the, the movement of food, uh, the processing of food, um, and the availability of food in the marketplace. And then linking that at a, at a higher level, the globalization of, of trade and, and the, um, the idea of uh, exports, both the domestic market, but, but, but the exports of, of uh, food commodities. Is, is part of the entire food system. So, you know, we, we are quite connected. And I do think that the current thinking on food systems is, is much more holistic, much more balanced. But just coming then to the specific question you were taking about agriculture and irrigation existing in separate ministries or se se separate departments, I think that's where we're at. And that's where, you know, my emphasis on strengthening institutions is important here that we, we no longer have these silo uh, uh, institutional arrangements, which don't actually ac acknowledge or integrate with other key aspects of supporting um, farming systems, uh, food systems. Um, and the obvious ones here is where the necessity to engage uh, agricultural production and environmental management more uh, in terms of, of, of how we go about our business. So I think the food systems approach, we recognize the importance of it. I think the economically um, more developed countries have, have moved on with accepting it and trying to plan accordingly. I think many poor, economically poorer countries are caught very much in a fragmented set of, of, of um, institutional arrangements, which don't bring a whole system approach to the way forward. Thanks, Jim. Now, we're not going to get through all of the questions because we're, we're nearing an end. I might just squeeze one more in, in a, a very uh, topical area, which is food waste. So the question is, how big a role does food waste from households and restaurants play in sustainability and hunger issues? And I'll ask you, Afrik, maybe to, to take that. Sure. Um, yeah, food waste is, is an obvious issue um, and as we look towards a more sustainable future from a food and nutrition perspective it's certainly one that we need to tackle and um, there's various kind of initiatives that have started I recently heard of one of the UK supermarkets is removing um, best before dates from food products in an attempt to reduce the amount of food that's wasted because of given dates. Now, obviously there's food safety concerns that, that you have to acknowledge when it comes to, to looking at dates and foods and things like that. But it certainly is um, an issue that we do need to look at 
And there are, are nice, small, practical ways that kind of at a household or individual level, we can address that. Um, and I suppose I'm kind of talking to that from an Irish perspective, as opposed to um, a kind of a poorer country perspective. Um, from the, the perspective of talking about hunger and malnutrition, there's the obvious issues around preservation practices and not having the facilities for preserving foods year round and again that again goes back to that issue of the kind of pre-post harvest the changes in food availability and and access um across the year and, and it's certainly another way in which we need to do more to improve year round access to food and, and it's partly down to that kind of preservation side of things there's one other kind of thing that i often bring up when it comes to talking about food waste and it's a bit controversial but um, it, it's thinking about food waste from the overconsumption perspective as well and, and, and looking at, you know, in Ireland and in other kind of high income countries, we have we have issues with overweight and obesity and we need to start kind of taking responsibility for, for, for that as well. So thinking about overconsumption as a potential for food waste as well as the, the, the types of food that we throw out. Um, so that would be something else I would add to that kind of conversation. Thanks, for, thanks very much, Africa. I think that important point around food processing as well, its role in food preservation and keeping food safe, as well as uh, reducing the uh, waste aspect of it. So I think I had better um, hand back to Taz to cl close out in the session. So it just remains for me to thank Afric and Jim very much for really what I found a fascinating discussion. And thanks to all of you who joined us today, particularly alumni from around the world. I see a great representation uh, from people in Kenya today, wonderful to see. Um, wearing my Vice President for Global Engagement hat, I did enjoy many gatherings of alumni around the world, be it China, uh, be it Europe, be it America, be it the Gulf States. We haven't had that opportunity for a while, so hopefully that will happen soon. I'll get to see all our alumni in, in present in, in the future. Um, taking what I heard from today is that we all have a voice and it's time for us all to activate our voice and give voice to the hungry through our personal activities, through our communities and indeed through our network. So thank you all for joining us and I'll hand back to Taz now. Thanks, everybody. Thanks very much indeed, Dolores, and thank you very much, Afric and Jim, for that fascinating discussion. And, uh, and, and thanks to everyone for, for tuning in and for, for engaging so fully in the, in the discussion. Um, it, it's such an important topic and, we, and, we, and with such a global imbalance and, and so important to be reminded of it. As, as, as Dolores implied at the outset, very few of us here can begin to understand what true hunger and food insecurity is like. Um, I found it so alarming to appreciate the scale of the problem uh, and to recognize that things are actually getting worse rather than better at the moment due to combinations of social, political, economic and environmental factors and, and even indeed the influence of COVID. And uh, it's also important to appreciate that there's a, a gender dimension here as with so many issues with, with women and girls being more affected. Uh, on the positive side, it, it's, it, it's heartening to, to know that it has been possible to make positive progress in the past and therefore there should be scope to do so again into the future. Um, and it was really good to hear Afric's valuable research insights to help underpin the strategies to alleviate the problem and change the direction of travel again, including the emphasis on micronutrients as well as just energy and protein and indications on short-term and longer-term solutions. And as, as Jim said, we really need quite a radically new approach, you know, preparedness to really consider how things are currently being done um, and, and change them because they, they are current, the approach currently is, is failing. And that's partly because it's such a complex problem with very diverse manifestations. And it would require not just changes to agricultural practices, but also wider education, concerted effort to improve access to food and to credit where needed. Um, and with tailor-made solutions in specific situations and for particular groups, responding to their own voices, which, which need to be combined and amplified. Um, flag, it's been flagged that diversification of income streams and dietary materials can be very helpful to families and communities, particularly given uh, the disruptive influence now and into the future of climate change. 
We heard that actions need to be better informed and more nuanced with better investment and substantial commitment. And that public bodies need to include and address directly the needs of the poor. That also that institutions need to be reconfigured to improve their engagement and effectiveness in developing more joined up thinking and action. Um, and we here need to become better informed and to advocate for change as individuals and organizations. And actually, these are themes that have really recurred in all of these conversations on the SDGs, which have examined already progress to date in the implementation of the SDGs. We've discussed the climate crisis, and we've asked what business and industry leaders can do in relation to the SDGs. And as I said, they're, they're, they're very common themes of the need for quite significant change and, and a greater level of engagement and, and joined up thinking. And you can access these conversations on the UCD alumni YouTube channel and soon also a recording of, of this event and the link for that should be popping up in the chat box at this point. So finally just to, uh, to plug a future event, um, it's Mark International Women's Day in 2022 on, on Tuesday March the 8th. Alumni relations are going to be celebrating women throughout the whole month of March. So there'll be events both online and on campus covering topics including how to build your career, discussions with alumni trailblazers and breaking biases. And the link for booking one or all of these events is again, should be appearing in the chat box and so will be available to you. So thanks once again to, um, to Dolores and our panelists and thank you all for joining us and I wish you a very good afternoon. <laughs>